high performing is New South Wales state of origin side. All right, they've put together one terrific performance and have a one nil lead. High performance is the Maroons state of origin side who have over a number of years now been able to sustain performance in beating their opposition. Seems to me that if, if we're a high performing team going to be the notion of first and all that sort of stuff, it is about setting new benchmarks. To me it is about wanting to change the game. It is about having everybody looking at what you're doing. Right? Every time that Australian cricket team walked on the field, it was our belief that we were already in front of the opposition. Simply because of the way that we played, it wasn't, it wasn't an arrogance, it was an inner confidence and there's a bit of a difference between both. It was that confidence that we took on the field that no matter who we were about to play, uh, where we were about to play them, what the circumstances were, we believed we could win. Didn't always happen that way, of course, uh, but that was our belief. And I think if we happened to transpose ourselves into the opposition dressing room, there would have been that same feeling from them most of the time, that they were about to play a team that they felt was going to be very difficult to beat. They felt like they were coming from behind. What I'd like to cover off then is, is what I see as five key principles to achieving that. Uh, they're not the only um, things that would enable you to be a high performance team, but there are five elements that I believe um, shape that. I'll just very quickly touch on the, the first one, which is around this concept of um, vision. And it just seems to me, I mean, vision can be long term, but nonetheless, vision can also still be the short term. And you'll see by way of that chart that I've got up there, in 2005, we'd lost an Ashes series. And of course, we know in sport that Australians can do most things, um, but losing the palms is not one of them. Uh, you just can't do that. So what happened in 2005, we lost, and so it was time then to sack the coach, change the captain, do a whole range of other things around the team. Um, and, and probably if I just digress for a moment, because I think it's, a, it, it's kind of a, an interesting lesson, irrespective of all that for, for any of us that are in, in leadership or management positions. Because we're all faced with that um, at, at some stage in our career or at some stages in our careers. Um, so here it was, time to get rid of the coach. I'd been with the, the team then by, for about six years. And uh, I guess um, like every, every business that you're in, there are times where do I still really want to do this? You know, is it, is it, because in our case, you're away, um, or you were away, some 250 days a year, really from home. So whether you played in Australia, or whether you played overseas, you're away from your own home, thereabouts, 250 days a year. Um, albeit that, you know, you're in an environment that you like and you love, and, and with people that are, are good people, you know. So there's, there's plenty of upsides, but there are other sides to any good job that, that can detract from it. So there was a question, do we need to keep the coach? So coming back to this notion of leadership, three questions that really always still <coughs> resonate in my um, mind that I asked myself at that point in time. First one was, um, could I still make a difference? You know, could I still make a difference? And not just, you know, move the chair from point A to point B, um, but redesign the chair. Do we need a chair? You know, so could I still make a difference? I had to, I had to know in myself that with the group of people that I got that it wasn't just going to be a little bit of incremental change. There, there was scope to do some, some real important stuff around this, this team. So that was one. Second was, um, basically as I said before, did I still have the energy? You know, so even if, even if I believed I could make some pretty important change, did I still want to actually get up every morning, go through all the routine stuff, um, 
whether that be training, whether that be preparing, whether that be getting on a plane, whether that be sitting at a game, whether that be analysing video or data or whatever it might be, did I still have the energy to do that? So that was the second question. And the third one was, uh, going back to the, the group that I operated with, did I still have their respect? And, and I knew at any stage, whether we were going well or we're not going well, you cannot necessarily command respect from every person there. That's not possible. But in going forward, did I have the respect of the majority of the key people in, in that team? Three questions, only I could answer them, and therefore, to do that, you have to look, you know, the usual story, look in the mirror. You have to actually answer yourself pretty honestly. So if it was no to any of those, then I wouldn't be certainly standing here today. I wouldn't have met Shalender in the first place. Um, and none of that would have happened. But I was, in my mind, yes, I could really still make a difference. Yes, I really still wanted to do it, but there was a finite length of time that I could do that for. And yes, I still had respect of sufficient numbers in that team to know that I could do uh, the first two. If, if any of those weren't a yes, then one, uh, I would have lost the respect of the players uh, because I just couldn't put the energy in or I just wouldn't be doing the job as I saw it should be done to make change, to be that benchmark, be benchmarker all the time, to try to change the game, to be, be in front all the time. Um, so, in effect, that, that's all I'm saying here. That was the bottom left-hand corner. The rest of it was then about setting little visions along the way, if you like, but the major vision for us at the end was this Everest called the Big Three. We had three tournaments. One was a Champions Trophy, which has just been played in England, or just currently being played in England now, uh, which Australia hadn't won ever. Uh, then we had the Ashes uh, to try to get those back, and then we were going to the World Cup in the West Indies. So it was about actually conquering those three. That was our Everest, and the strategy to get there on those steps was uh, being the best skilled team the world had ever seen. That was that was a driving for it. But as I said, it was only a real quick hit be because I think that's still pretty important to understand that as part of the um, makeup of a high performance team. Now the leader, the leader, right? So in terms of what you're uh, doing and what you have done and what you will be doing, as Shalendra um, has rightly said, it's, it's irrespective of, of what's going on around you. you know, leadership is leadership is leadership. It just doesn't start at one point and finish at another point because something may be happening within your organisation or external to your organisation or to you personally. Leading is about leading. Leading is about doing. It's about actions and behaviours. Leaders, formal leaders ourselves, it's about walking the walk, talking the talk. It's an old cliche, but it, it just goes without saying it must be done. So however you want your team to operate or however... Um, you want your organisation to operate, if there's a whole set of values that you think are really important, the only way that those values are important is if you as a leader value them. And by valuing them, that means that you actually deliver them day in, day out. It's, it's simple. Hard to do, simple. And that's what leaders do, true leaders do. When we talk about leadership, when we talk about leadership culture, there, there are three parts. Firstly, it is the leader, which we've just talked about. The next part then is around um, our people, our people. And, and that is definitely about trying to make sure that everybody leads. Everybody has the opportunity to lead. Everybody wants to have that opportunity, wants to be given that opportunity. They want to be placed in situations where they have to make decisions on behalf of the rest of the group. The young girl who sits out there on the counter, right, who is, right at this moment, I suggest, the leader of the organisation because she's the one that's fielding everybody that comes up from the lift to the front counter or she's the one that's fielding every call that's coming in here at the moment. We want her to make good decisions on behalf of the organisation. She's the leader, right? 
So right at the moment, as people approach her, she just needs to be there and understand exactly here, listen and know what to do with that. She's telling everybody about the trust company. Not you, she is. Obviously, hopefully you've given her all the training and the support and everything else and the skills to do that, which is really important and why we coach and why we manage and, and so on. But in the end, she's the one that's making the decisions for us. All right, so she's the leader. So that's why we're trying to make sure that we always encourage, I think, all our staff at every opportunity we get to go and make a decision, maybe to come and get outside that comfort zone. And this is coming to the third part, our systems and processes. If, if any of those things, and, and we'll put, you know, you'll have all your words and so on, but if you put any word up there, any word, you've got to live it. Otherwise, you don't value it. So don't put it up there. Okay? If, if we can't actually live what we say we're going to be, then don't do it. Don't, don't say it. You're better off saying nothing uh, than saying something that you can't actually uphold on a regular basis. System and process, I think, is always a, an interesting one. So Shalendra mentioned... Um, when I started with Queensland in 94, 95, um, you know, one of the things that everybody has in, in, in all their organisations and all their teams is incredible IP, you know, incredible knowledge and experience and so on. And that's just so important, that reservoir uh, of expertise <coughs> that you need to make sure that's very much a part of what you do every day. And so the same in a sporting environment. You know, there's so many players out there that have experienced so many things and have great intuition. You know, when I looked at people like McGrath and Warren, um, one of the reasons why they were so good, in my mind, was that they, they had this incredible ability in their mind to filter through games, days, wickets, <coughs> events, and be able to pull out a file that told them in this particular situation, I can recall that, and this is what I did. So this is what I will now do. Whereas that's why in terms of our younger players, and going back to what I was about to say, was let's complement all that intuition and knowledge and experience with something that is actually finite. So that's where we decided that computers can do that for us, surely. So that was where we introduced computers to say, well, now, yes, let's be able to be more precise with both feedback to our players, okay, so when they played a game, uh, rather than saying at the end of the game, yeah, no, I felt pretty good, or no, geez, bad day, well now let's give them some precise information, both data and vision, so that they can make a far better, and we can make a far better assessment on what their performance was. Often in any day that we've had, or any week that we've had, it's highlighted by some great things and some terrible things, or poor things, or things that we're really disappointed with. But there's a stack of stuff in between. There's a lot of stuff in between that actually um, say, should say to us that we've done some really good stuff. We should be able to pat ourselves on the back for. But instead, we, we tend to be drawn by the highs and the lows because they're the things that sort of stick in your mind. They're the things that you either can't get rid of or you really want to celebrate. You know? so, so that's why computers come in. So as a, as a system for us, one, it provided far more precise feedback, but it also enabled us then to begin to be better analysts, quantitative analysts, of our opposition, looking very carefully at what the opposition were doing and being able then to look at data and begin to develop some patterns of, of the way that either individuals or teams played. So going back to this whole concept of leadership and leadership culture, Three, those three parts, I think, are really, really important. The leader must walk the walk. We want all our staff 
to be leaders or given the opportunity to lead, to want to lead, and then let's keep ensuring or keep trying to ensure that all our systems, processes, whatever they might be, are somewhere or at least advancing to the leading edge. The, the learning environment, in a sense, two parts. We heard a little bit before about the whole person. So firstly, what are these players and what are your staff really currently wanting to do? Well, they want to be skilled, don't they? You know, they want to know their job. They've got to know their job um, because that's really important to them and to you as an organisation. So from our point of view and, and probably yourself, you know, technically, you know, what are the skills that they need? For us, it's bat, bowl, field. You've got a whole set of other technical skills. Then mental skills. The mental skills, that, that ability, as I was saying before, that ability to find the, the trigger, the routine that gets you into the moment. You know, Steve War, again quoting, talked about mental toughness. Everybody hears this word, mental <coughs> toughness. His definition was that you're able to give 100% attention to each moment. Okay, so a moment comes along, as I said, he's got to hit a ball. Right at that, just as that ball is being released, he's just there. Irrespective of the crowd, the wicket, the bowler, the field, what happened the night before, what's going to happen in three weeks' time. He's just there in that moment and he can deal with that, right? But mental toughness then is to do that the next time and the next time and the next time and through the course of five days or a series or a season, okay? That's his definition of mental toughness. So just being um, in the moment. So that's the mental side, you know? And tactical side or strategic side, and I notice in your uh, talent development program, that's part of the progression. So when uh, you get to that general manager stage, it is about strategic thinking, not as though that it just happens then, it's happening all the way through, but at a point, your tactical skills as a formal leader, your strategic skills are really important. So what do we do now? Why do we do it? Where's the opposition going? How can we be ahead of them? What are some of the most, you remember I talked about that vision and about the, the Everest and the, the World Cups. Our key strategy, our key strategic thinking was being the best skilled team the world had ever seen. So that was technical, physical, mental, tactical. Then throw in a few team skills. And then to the other part is about the person. It's about the person. So for me, probably even sometimes more important than the other. How do you deal with your staff? Are they a staff person or are they just like us, a person who, you know, we wake up, we have a good day, we've got to walk the dog, bloody tree falls on our house, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> um, you know, so everybody every day is going through so many different things. So do we know that as a leader? How do we know that? What sort of relationship do I have with my staff? Talent. Um, and, and in a sense, it's, you know, it goes without saying that, and, and many people have said it to me, I suppose, that you know, anybody could have coached uh, that Australian cricket team. And, and maybe they're correct. Uh, that that may, may very well be true. Um, but if it is true, it seems to me that underneath that, what they're saying is then, same as you, all you do is go out into the marketplace and you find the very best people and you just put them in a room and suddenly you're the best team and you'll always be the best team. But I think we're probably all aware that it's a little bit more than that. And so part of this, the, the, uh, the talent equation, if you like, for me is it is about difference. It's about actually trying to find different people. Different people bring lots of debate and lots of discussion because they'll come from different perspectives. The job of the leader and the manager and the coach, etc., then, is really to, one, nurture that, if you like, conflict, but manage the conflict so that it's healthy, not unhealthy. So talent and the application is not just about the skills that we have in the office to deliver the game plan. 
okay? The talent and the difference is about, I think, creating lots of debate and lots of discussion and making sure that we have some connections through those differences so that we've got a good feel for how we're operating as a group. Adam Gilchrist was another in that, in that same vein. What would I term a, a connector? Wonderful player, as we know, but one of his great skills that he brought into this group was this ability to connect. Middle, he had good ears to do that with. Um, but um, fantastic connector. And when I say we lost the 2005 Ashes series, one of the things that happened there was that I lost two of my connectors. Tim Nielsen, at that stage, we'd sort of sent him back to Cricket Australia to head up the Centre of Excellence because he wanted to be head coach. There was no way that he'd be head coach if he just remained as my assistant. So I, I had a new coach over there. So I lost one part of my connection. And then when I was over there on tour, basically Adam Gilchrist uh, and a couple of other guys had their families there. So they, in fact, were actually staying away from the team hotel. They were staying in a different hotel. And so, one of, as I said, one of Gilly's great strengths, one of his great talent skills, if you like, was that ability to, to keep in touch and therefore for me to be able to talk with him and understand where things were at. But he was, he'd come to training, come on the bus, train, come back on the bus, then go. So he wasn't in and around the group. And so we lost a bit of that interaction, which I think was one of the complicating factors on that, on that tour. The last one, um, in a sense, is about measuring performance. So we've talked a, bit, a little bit about already, um, I guess, some of the results. And of course, like you and, and the chairman, who um, smiling very happily there when he looked at those figures, you can't deny them. I mean, you've got to produce them. There's no doubt about that. You've got to have the numbers. Um, and certainly from a sporting perspective, uh, if you're not getting results, then you probably don't get too many chances to keep producing those. All right, so you, you do have to actually produce results. But for me, it's about the process. It's about measuring the process to get to the results. Do we clearly understand what it is that's going to get us there? When you play well, when you have had a good quarter, right? When you've had a good six months, when you've had a good year, do you clearly understand what got you there? Or indeed, what are some of the things, what are some of the handbrakes that are holding you back, that are, are not enabling you to do better? What are those things? And, and we can talk about all our KPIs and so on. To me, it's so important that you've got to keep going back into those and trying to work out, are they really the ones that make a difference in our business? Here are a couple of other things just to uh, run by you. If I went into that Australian cricket team and tried to pick out some things that I could see, all right, evidence of what was going on, there are things like this word failure wasn't there. You know, it was a case that we were never, never going to be beaten. Even though you do get beaten, we're always there, uh, never wanting to be beaten. I think Tony and I have sort of talked about loss aversion. Um, and, and very much that Australian cricket team was driven by that. Second test that I was involved in, uh, which was in Tasmania um, in 99. Uh, and Pakistan had Australia on the ropes there. We were about 520 chasing 360. And then suddenly Gilchrist and Langer began to put this partnership together. And one of the, you know, again trying to keep it simple, but at the same stage trying to actually learn from what was going on in the moment. When we would have a break, in other words, a lunch break or a tea break or a start of play, um, it was about getting those two guys just to tell the group what the hell they were doing out there. Not necessarily what the wicket was doing or what the bowlers were doing, but how they were thinking, how they were responding to the moment. Because, again, we lose a wicket, somebody else goes in, and you would like for them to actually kind of fit in neatly while that other person who's been, excuse me, been there for a while can get them in and get them started and get us on the right track again. Um, and, and we did. We ended up getting up in that game. And so this, this, this feeling of never... You, 
at the same stage, like everything, your strength becomes your weakness. And in the 17th game, we'd won 16 in a row, beaten India in the first test in India, went to the second test in Calcutta and made 440 first innings, rolled uh, India out for 170. So here we are, leading by 270, having won the first test, three test series, um, and so automatically send the opposition back in. And this is a famous test match where Laxman and Dravid then got together and put together an incredible partnership, and in the end we lost the test match. Now, right at that moment, right at that moment where we'd dismissed India and had this incredible lead, did we stop and think, no, you know, we can't be beaten. At that moment in time, I think we were at that point of arrogance, not necessarily inner confidence. There was that arrogance. Now, if we had stopped and thought for two minutes, we probably still would have made the same decision. But there would have been some assessment, some risk assessment, if you like, of the fact that the only way that India could actually get back in the game was if we sent them back in, because we'd already bowled and therefore our bowlers had to go back out and the wicket was wearing, that means we were going to have to bat last on it. And if we weren't able to get through them as quickly as we would have liked, then we were placing ourselves possibly at risk of losing. We still, I think, would have made the same decision but maybe, just maybe, there would have been some um, uh, dusting off, if you like, of the arrogance and placing it back in, the, in that realm of never being beaten, a bit of inner confidence that we will be able to do this. Um, I talked about process, reviewing uh, objectively rather than emotionally, you know. So when we are going well, what is it that we are doing? What do we see? What do we see? You know? What do we see? We see happy faces. We see people turning up early. We see people maybe staying late. We see collaboration uh, between departments. What do we see? They're the, they're the critical moments. They're the critical things to capture. Because again, as you know, um, this, this team plays well but it gets beaten. You play well but you don't always get results. And and so when you go back to analyse, when you go back to analyse, it's so important that you go back to the things that you know are, work for you when things are going well. If you do those things, you make sure that they're happening, then your business will again turn itself back around. But often, certainly individually, and certainly sports people are guilty of this, is that, and you can't blame them, is that when things are really going well, it's so difficult to stop and analyse what it is you're doing because you've heard of the, in the moment, in the flow, you know, just let it happen. And that is so important because you don't want to get caught up with the, the analysis of what's going on because you, you're just playing so well that you've got to let it flow. But somewhere on the line, as individual or as a group, you've got to start working out what is it that we are doing. Because if you leave it to the times when things aren't going well, then we get just paralysed by analysis. Because all we do, do then is deal with all the things that are not working. We forget and we can't find and we can't see those checkpoints that are really important to us, really important to us at those times. So it's really important to understand when we're being successful, what is it we're doing? And then other things that are, are pretty... Um, obvious, if you like, is this notion back to basics. You know, when, when this team's playing well, everybody's just doing the basics. Everybody does the basics. Do the basics right, the brilliance comes out. All right? But we've got to have the basics right. Got to just do, but what are the basics? You've got to understand your own basics. Um, there's a real competitiveness in the team, you know, which is great. You know, you go to a training session and it's, it's feisty. You know, the bowlers are at the batters, the batters are at the bowlers. There's chat going on. It's a fantastic session, you know? So that, that real sort of interplay between players. I mentioned the banter and the swagger. You know, when things are tight, then somebody, some bodies will step up. May not always be the same body, but some people will step up. No cutting corners. You know, one of the, one of the outcomes of our loss 
in uh, England against, uh, or in the Ashes against England in 2005, was that was clearly identified by the group. Little things were just being um, overlooked. Whether it be just a bit of punctuality, whether it be a bit of dress code, um, you know, whether it be a bit of uh, precise, more precise information or, or less information or the coach letting sessions go too long. Little things were just always creeping in. It wasn't anything massive. And, and, and some of the bigger, things, the bigger things were easy to see and easy to fix. But generally it's the little things are the ones that are actually bringing you down. Just, again, final summary for yourselves about creating possibilities. You know, like that's about no matter what's going on out there, what can we do? You know, what are the exciting things in front of us that we can do? Um, people take places where they haven't been before, as we were saying before, let's grow them. You know, let's give them an opportunity. Using our environment to set the benchmarks, always. What are those standards? And again, systems and process. Let's make sure we've got those laid down.